Thank you, Mayor. I'm honored to be with you. Let us begin with some editorials from the Birmingham News. One of the editorials from the Birmingham News said, the first editorial said when I was leaving after I announced my resignation, they said we are losing a very good general. That was one of the comments from the Birmingham News. A week later, they wrote that for 20 years, Arrington fought his way through the arena, moving the city forward against an often hostile environment. He lived in the fishbowl filled with contention, and for that effort and for his de dedication to the city and his many, many successes, a loud, sustained standing ovation is in order as he leaves City Hall. Well, I felt very good about that. The Birmingham News had for 20 or 30 years followed my life as a politician. They had oftentimes written about me. A few times they had written favorably about me. Many times, as they do with elected officials, they had been very critical of what we were doing. But I welcome those editorials that morning because we were I was in somewhat in pain. So I want to begin trying to explain that uh, to you, what, what had happened. We had, I was somewhat in pain because we had just lost a major election for a program, an economic development program that uh, we call MAPS. And so I needed somebody to, to show me a little pity. We'll talk more about maps later on. But I want first to talk about how we got to July 1999. That's what that comment is from July 1999 in the paper. And I want to focus on the struggle that our citizens had to build this city to where it is here today. So let's begin with something you are probably familiar with, and that's Birmingham's birth as a city. Back in 1871, I think most of us know that, it was founded just after the Civil War. Now, I belong to an African-American generation, which is uh, very uh, stone's throw from American slavery. From, the time to, from time to time, in my youth, I sat around fireplace and other places and listened to adults, relatives of mine, talk about what slavery was like. When I was five years old, my father moved uh, the family to Birmingham. But my brother and I spent many, many summers back down on the farm. Every summer, every summer when school was out, my mom and dad would pack up my brother and me, and he'd take us to the bus station, the Greyhound station right over there in front of City Hall, give us a shoebox with fried chicken and biscuits in it, and send us down to the country to spend time with our grandparents. When, when, I, when I think about it, I recognize that when Birmingham was founded, my maternal great-grandfather, Oliver Bell, with whom I spent quite a bit of time because he, he, uh, he, he lived uh, uh, until I was 10 years old. 
He had just, when Birmingham was founded, he had just become a free person out of slavery. He was six years old when President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He and his mother, father, and brother were property of Tress Van and Lula de Graffenry, who were plantation owners down in Livingston, Alabama. And somebody here tonight from Sumter County spoke to me, down in Sumter County. On my paternal side, my father's side, I also shared part of the summer with my grandfather, with his, grand, uh, his father. Now, my grandfather was Matthew, and his mother, Amy, who lived there, was also a former slave. And I remember her, and she was nine years old when the Emancipation Proclamation was passed. Now, I use that background setting for tonight because this is a Black History Month. And uh, this is a Black History program. And there is something notable, at least in my mind, about the fact that the first African American mayor of this post Civil War city has roots back in slavery, not far removed from slavery. So when Birmingham was founded, Slavery had just ended. Now we all know the story of Birmingham's founding. I won't belabor that fact, except I want to point out that there were numerous, there are numerous references, numerous references in the history books about Birmingham, the magic city. As late as 1948, people were writing about the magic in the city of Birmingham. During his first century, Birmingham endured a lot and overcame quite a bit. It overcame a great cholera epidemic. It overcame a situation where it had seen 120 blacks trampled to death at a church in Birmingham where Booker T. Washington spoke and somebody yelled out, fight, and they thought they said fire. And the people rushed out and 120 blacks were trampled that night. Birmingham suffered from the Great Depression, suffered greatly, great misery from the 1933 Depression. But each time, the city bounced back, and it was stronger each time. Now here's a description of Birmingham in a 1948 book, and I want to quote that. It says, Birmingham is, a preeminently, is preeminently a city of the New South. It is the largest city in the South surpassed in population and economy only by New Orleans. It is a bustling city called the Magic City. It is a bustling city called the Magic City. Well, that is what people thought of Birmingham back during that time that we were a magic city on our way. In fact, he closed it out by saying, Birmingham is one of the, is the youngest of the world's great cities. Back in 1948, they were writing. We were one of the young city, one of the world's great cities. That was a paradox, however. And it stemmed from the fact that Birmingham had a number of bouts with racial violence and its embrace of the Dixiecrat Convention. In 1948, the Democratic Party split over the civil rights platform. Southern Democrats left the party and formed the Dixiecrat. 
they held their convention at Boutwell Auditorium in Birmingham, Alabama. That was one of the missteps, as it turns out in history, of this young, dynamic city. Birmingham was rapidly going from a city with an international reputation of being modern and progressive to a reputation of being called the Johannesburg of the South, largely because of its racial policies. The single most important local event that showed that Birmingham might be shifted from a government of racial oppression to a more racially conciliatory government was the city's move to change its form of government. It changed its form of government from a city commission to a mayor council form of government. It did that to rid itself of the count of the city commission and of Bull Connor. And so we want to just focus on that for a minute. Here's how that started. Here's what brought that about. On Mother's Day in 1961, Freedom Riders arrived in Birmingham at the Trailway bus station down on 4th Avenue and 18th Street. They were attacked and brutally beaten while the police stayed away and permitted them to be beaten. At last, with that event, the Birmingham media and the business community spoke out against the county, the city commission, for permitting such a violent incident to take place in Birmingham. And it set in motion to change the form of government to a mayor council form of government which it did in 1962. Now, when I think about that, I remember what Dr. King said in his book, one of his books, entitled Why We Can't Wait. He writes that in, the, in a chapter he called the Summer of Our Discontent. He's writing about Birmingham in Birmingham. He says, the tragedy of the old Birmingham was not the brutality of the bad people, but it was the silence of the good people. And I think that really described the problem, one of the problems we had in Birmingham. In fact, if I can see the next slide. In fact, it would take Tragedies, serious tragedies, oftentimes to get the good people in Birmingham to speak up and provide leadership. The form of government was changed by the Young Men Business Club, led by David Van. I think I have a, we'll see David Van later. Uh, David Van, we changed the form of government. People did not speak up again until 1963, September when the church was bombed and four young girls were killed. And then people became alarmed again. And the business community and the news media that had not been speaking up about the problems in Birmingham, especially those of race, began to say, we must change things. So we tend to react when we have difficult problems and everybody knows the sad story of the young women in Birmingham. Another important change in Birmingham occurred in 1974, and I want to talk just a bit about that. In 1974, Congress passed what is known as the Community Development Act of 1974. Could I have the next slide, please? Yeah. Congress passed what's called the Community 
Development Act of 1974, or we come talk about the Community Block Grant Program. It provided community input in community development programs. The act itself was a godsend of Birmingham's black community. The black community of Birmingham had oftentimes been ignored by its city government. But the black community was beginning to increase the number of voters in the black community. And along comes, oh, at the same time, the Community Development Act, which says that you must have, community must have input. With that act in 1974, Birmingham's community, including its black community, became very involved in community development and what happens in the city. And I think even to this day, when I look at what the great job that our mayor has done, and when he starts talking about people and the theme, I have to think, oh, I know what he's talking about, uh, how people make a difference. And of course, we had this, we still have this government, and everybody is familiar with it. We formed a, a program with a neighborhood association. We had, a, we had the community advisory committee, the citizen advisory board, and of course, the mayor and, and council are all involved in our citizen participation program. Birmingham has a, received recognition as one of the outstanding community development programs uh, in America. In 1975 and 76, Hood declared the Birmingham Citizen Participation Program to be an outstanding example of what they call grassroots democracy. It pointed out in this report to Congress that year and two years later that the program that Birmingham had produced spawned neighborhood strategy areas, it spawned community development corporations in Birmingham communities, it reversed much of the neighborhood decline and deterioration that was taking place in Birmingham, a 1992 study by Bob Wilson, a professor at UAB, talked about the number of units of new and rehab housing that had come about because of the block grant program in Birmingham being led by the citizens of the city. It, he talks about how it increased the number of, of citizens who would decide to run for office because they had been active in their neighborhood programs. And so, this was for us a godsend. The program truly puts people first. And I fully understand what the mayor says. I want to skip and talk a little bit about the coming of a black mayor. I've got another slide on that. In 1979. Most of you probably already know that story. But bear with me for just a few minutes and let me talk about that. How did Richard Arrington get to be mayor? Well, I see that guy around, he can't speak. <laughs> he got this loud voice, whiny voice. And how did he get to be mayor? Well, I ask myself that sometimes. <laughs> Let me tell you that story. I returned to this city after completing my work in science out at the University of Oklahoma. And I worked at Miles College as chairman of the science department, later on as dean of the college. Then when the Ford Foundation gave a, a huge grant to the four-year black, to the eight four-year black colleges in Alabama to promote cooperation between the colleges. The presidents of those colleges formed something called the Alabama Center for Higher Education, 
and they hired an executive director, and they hired me as the executive director. That's Alabama A&M, Alabama State, Tuskegee, Steelman, Talladega, uh, Oakwood College, uh, so I can, can't remember all of them. But they hired me, and I had left Miles College, and, they, and I had moved to downtown Birmingham. My office is in 2121 building. When I think about that, that's always interesting. I was the first black organization to move into the 2121 building. <laughs> The first black. The second one was Adams, Baker, and Clement came after. We, after we got down there, and we weren't run out. They moved down. And then we got a third black organization in 2121. And of course, IRS used to be there in the 2121 building. Well, I had never thought about politics. I had, I had I, about running for office. I was very much aware of the struggle that went on for people to vote. I grew up and I saw in our black community people studying questions, hoping they'd know the answers when they got down to the, the registrar's office. I remember that our church would provide the bus and give training sessions to try to help you know the answers. And then we'd go down to the courthouse and they'd ask us questions that we didn't know enough. And it didn't matter how much education you had. We had people who had doctorate degrees, medical degrees, teachers and all, and they said we didn't know enough to vote. So I was very much aware of the struggle that went on in the black community. You couldn't live there and not see the struggle that went on in, uh, in, in, in the black community. So let's get back to how I got it. I'm in my office down in 2121 building. I uh, had been at Miles, Miles College students had, had been very active in what was going on, marching, protesting, praying, doing a whole lot of things. Four Miles College students showed up in my office one evening about four o'clock, and much to my surprise, they'd come to see me and they wanted me to run for mayor. We had one black on the city council at that time. We had an at-large city council, and that black member was Arthur Shores, an outstanding civil rights attorney whose home was bombed in Birmingham two or three times. I don't have time to tell you all that story. But when we changed the form of government, we had nine council members who ran at large in the entire city. When one of them died, the council appointed the first black, Arthur Shores. Then the next time around, Arthur ran, and so he became the first black to serve in the city council. So now they have come, the young people come to me, young Miles College students, and they want me to run for mayor, and I immediately say no. And they said, if you will not run for mayor, then will you run for the city council? And I am really concerned about it. I'm pleased that they are concerned about what's going on in that neighborhood. They are telling me they want some, they need some more black representation in the city government. And I didn't want it say no, I'd never thought about it. But I, in my mind, I kept thinking, how am I gonna get out of this? And so finally I said to him, well, I'll tell you what, let, let me think about it. Come back tomorrow, let me think about it. I'll give you an answer. Well, the truth was, I was hoping they were gonna come back tomorrow. <laughs> but sure enough, the next day, they were back in my office around four o'clock. And they got talking, telling me what all they would do to help me and how they would work for the campaign. And, and I, I was too embarrassed to say no. And so I said yes. That is how I ended up running. Now young people got me into it. So I became the second black person elected to the Birmingham City Council. All of us running at large in the entire city. I, I used to listen then when I got on the council, I listened to the talk shows and what was going on. What was the reaction to my being elected from the black community? Well, blacks of my generation and older ones were very pleased. They got a second black. Now, a lot of the young people, however, 
who were responsible for my gut going in the first place, oftentimes got on the talk shows and they weren't that happy. They, they got Arrington on there. And they say this time they just got him a black with a PhD. And he ain't never done nothing. And that's what they said. They said he hadn't marched. He ain't he never marched a single time. We've been protesting and Arrington had never done a thing. And so that was a mixed reaction. But on the city council, I began to learn how government works. And I began to use the city council meeting to bring about issues. And to make a long story short, uh, every so-called affirmative action ordinance during the eight years I was on the council that was passed was ordinances that I introduced. Uh, in, a, in addition to that, that was a great problem in the black community between police and the black community. Uh, police brutality was very, very common. Uh, any black person living in Birmingham during that time was fearful of the Birmingham Police Department. It had one of the worst reputations going. And so I, one of my assignments on the council was to work on the Public Safety Committee. My second assignment was to work on setting up the internet system for the first time in Birmingham. And the third one was to do something about transportation because we were switching over from a, a privately owned transit system to a publicly owned transit system. We're still wrestling with that today. We haven't really got that done yet. So once uh, I, I began doing that, I had many people coming to me complaining about police brutality. Some of the folk were good law and bad, even some of them were terrible folk. But they'd show up in my office, they'd be battered and bruised, and so I'd start taking statements from them. And I would take that picture, and then I'd say, well, can you come to the council meeting on Tuesday? And they'd show up, and when they call for my report, I'd say, Mr. So-and-so, would you come up, please? And he'd come up there all feet and bruised, and, that, and I'd tell his story. And then I'd ask the chief, would you please investigate this and see what happened? In fact, I look at my record, there were 18 different cases that I handled. That is how I became the political darling of the black community. <laughs> a black community that wondered what I was going to do when I got there, and I did too, but it wondered what I was going to do when I got there. And all of a sudden, for the next 10 to 12 years, black voters in Birmingham were in love with me. <laughs> we had many cases of police problems, I talked about 18 cases that I filed on behalf of people. We had cases that folks don't much know about. Uh, we had some terrible cases. I can think about some, some really very bad cases. But the case that caught everybody's attention was the Benita Carter case. And you know the Benita Carter story. 20-year-old black woman, and she was killed by a police officer mistaking kind of identity case, shot her in the back several times when she the car. And anyway, uh, and the officer was saying, and saying, I, I knew him by name, I had been filed, I had filed six or seven complaints against him. And I had said to David Van, the mayor, uh, I had asked him to move Sands. I said, will you move Sands out of the, the precinct out there uh, and put him in the south side in the white precinct? I said, I don't think he'll beat up the white folk like he's doing the black folk. <laughs> and, and Van said he would do that. But he didn't. And it would end up changing David's political career. I'm at home one evening, answering the phone, and it's the police chief, Bill Myers. And he says to me, Mayor, uh, uh, Councilman, would you come go with me, please, out to Kingston? Uh, I said, where? I'm at City Hall. I'll wait for you. I rushed down to City Hall, got in the car with the police chief, drove out to Kingston. Kingston was almost on fire. The citizens of Kingston were up in arms, throwing bricks, yelling. They were angry over the Bonita car case. Uh, I got there on one side of the street with our special police force trying to protect the store 
on the other side were hundreds of black folk throwing balls and cussing and going on. And so uh, the chief wanted me to go there because he realized that the black community knew who I was and I had been dealing with police. So I got out and of course we worked for a while, gave me a loud speaker and, so, uh, and eventually quieted the whole down. David Van was, uh, did great things for the city. I, I, I think I got a picture of David. I don't know what comes up. Yeah, that's David Van. David was a mayor. I learned a lot from David. We were both elected to the city council at the same time. And I got to know David, and I really thought that one, David Van is one of the smartest persons when it comes to municipal law of anybody I knew. I don't care what you want to talk about municipal law in Alabama. He could tell you about it, talk about it, had an idea how to do it and all that. And so we got to be uh, uh, good friends. I, 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 so I came back. Uh, I found out who the officer was that, was that day, and I knew we were in trouble. Well, what David did, he did set up a special citizen committee to look at the Bonita Card case. He selected seven citizens. They voted six nothing with one person abstaining. Said the police officer was not justified in using force. And of course, people then wanted the officers to fire. And David Van wrestled with that issue and finally decided that he was not going to fire the officer, but he would do a number of other things. He'd give him desk duty. He'd even try to transfer him to the fire department and so forth. But the black community was marching every week over Benita Carter. They were angry about it. They had marched and complained to David Van at City Hall. And yet, David in the final analysis, to make the story short, in the final analysis, uh, he didn't fire the officer. The ministers were leading, the black ministers, the ministerial association, uh, association was leading the protest. We were waiting there. We were waiting for David to say what he was going to do with the officers. He had taken two or three weeks. So David sends out a message to the ministers, the committee, to meet with him. He's called a press conference at 10 o'clock that morning, and he's going to announce his decision about that case. But he gave the courtesy of calling the preacher's committee in, and he asked me to join the committee. So five of them came to David's office, and he explained that he had gone through all the policies and that we just were not training police officers, right, so forth and so on, and what he was going to do, he was just going to put this guy on desk duty. And of course, the minister started yelling, and, no, don't do that. And David is sitting at his desk down in the city hall in the council chamber. All the news media are there waiting for his 10 o'clock announcement. He is in his office. The poor, the ministers are shouting at him. So finally he gives up. He just gets his papers off his desk and starts walking out to go down to the press conference. The preacher's rocking right behind him. Mel, don't do that. Don't do that. He goes down and he reads the statement. More protests follow that. The next day, and I'm about to end the story at last, uh, next week or so, I get a call one morning from one of the ministers, Jared, pastor of Trinity Baptist Church, and he wants to know, Mayor, uh, Councilman, can you come to meet him? Someone's going to meet with you. I walked into the meeting at Trinity that morning. And lo and behold, there were about 50 black ministers sitting there. And what they had already decided, that I had to run for me. I didn't know that. <laughs> but they gave it away as I walked in to the room. Reverend Jerry said, come on in, brother mayor. They called me mayor. It hit me. Long story short, they told me, oh, you, you know, we got to run. It's time for us to have a black mayor. And Jerry, and those of you who know him, you know him, he was really hammering me, saying, you, you can win, can't you? 
things of that sort. And I'm hesitating and saying, well, well, I, well, well I think I can. He, well, hell, we're going to get them out. He said. <laughs> and so it's like, we've already called the press conference for tomorrow at 11 o'clock. <laughs> and we want you to be there. We've been supporting you all the time. That's how I got to be mayor of the city of Birmingham. Let's see what our next slide. What did Birmingham face? And I'm going to run through this fast. We won't get into all detail. I ran for mayor, and that was an interesting story. Uh, we accomplished some things when I was mayor, mainly because the black community of Birmingham took me and put me on their shoulders. And they supported me on everything they wanted done. Even when I didn't do well, they still supported me. They never, never left me mayor. They never left me until about my third or fourth term. I had strong support from the black community. I was elected. At the time I was elected, that was the economy in Birmingham and in the country. Remember, President Carter was president. That was a 17 to 20 percent unemployment rate in the country. The night I was elected president, it wasn't just a Birmingham celebration, it was a war celebration. The night, as soon as the results came in, I'm about, this Parliament House is rocking, loaded with black folk. I'm about to go downstairs with my family. We're about to walk down the phone rings. The security says, wait a minute, here's somebody. It's President Carter. On the, he called that night because Birmingham had elected a black mayor. The whole news media, not only in America, but go down to the archives and read the newspaper from Japan. That my picture years that night. <laughs> read it in Mexico and all the languages. Why? Birmingham, Alabama, of all places. Had elected a black. Why? Because most of those reporters had been here during the 60s. And when that movement, Dr. King led, was over, they went home. <clears throat> they forgot about Birmingham. And then all of a sudden, here it is in 1979, they read Birmingham elected a black man, not Birmingham. And that is, is what had happened. But we, the economy was in back shape. U.S. Steel, which had provided many jobs for us, used to have 30,000 jobs, we're down to 3,000 jobs. Uh, white folk were leaving the city because I was a black man. White folk were leaving. The word got out to me that, that U.S. Steel was thinking about closing. So I got on the phone and I called out to Fairfield to the U.S. Steel office and asked if I could come out for a meeting. And they graciously permitted it. And I went out and talked with them and they told me no, uh, that was not true. They had about 3,000 jobs. And so that was a little relief. But within a month, they shut down completely. Every job, U.S. Steel closed down. They've come back now with about 3,000 jobs in recent years, but we lost our jobs. That was our economy. We are still tight. We were. We were the only place in the world where you can find all the raw ingredients for making steel in one place. That's what Red Mountain is all about, the iron ore, limestone, coal everywhere. We were a steel company. Now the steel industry is going to pot. People like my dad, who could make 15, 16, 17 dollars an hour, lose that job when the steel mills close and can't find that kind of work. Folk are losing their homes. All I'm saying, we started off facing a very tough labor market. Can I see the next slide? Please, see one. So how do we rebound from the economic crisis? Here's, a, here's where I saw the problem. 
Now, I'm trying to cut this show. Birmingham was facing three major problems all at one time. They were facing a transition, a political transition. It's black citizens having political power for the first time. At the same time, it is facing an economic transition. The steel mills are closing their job. And the third thing that's happening at the same time is they're trying to, we are trying to set up some ways to produce what we call biracial communication. Because for about a decade before that, it used to be blacks and whites couldn't meet in the same room in Birmingham. And some of that still lingered even years later. So that we had not had a lot of black-white communication. We got to have all three of those at the same time. I give the citizens of Birmingham great credit for that. That they could jump a three major transition, any one of which would put a city in trouble. They handled all three of them at the same time. We eventually bound, got out of it. We transformed our economy. I started off with the first project I was going to do as mayor was going to redevelop Birmingham downtown Block 60. Block 60 is a major block down there. That's where, uh, where the Regions Bank and the other bank and finance center, right there. That's called Block 60. And so we set up a program, we're going to start that out, we're going to redevelop that first. Uh, it turned out to flop, totally. We went out for proposals, the city did. It was going to be a $125, $150 million project. We had 12 companies to compete for it. We selected one company to carry out the project. We were going to help them acquire the land, buy up the land. They were owned mainly by Greek citizens in Birmingham, and that had to be some fight with the Greeks. And in fact, the Greeks killed Block 60. Block 60 died because of that. Uh, at the same time that was happening, uh, River Chase was there developing and so we're sucking all the life out of the river chase. So we're having a truly uh, difficult time. One thing we had going for us at UAB, I give the Chamber great credit. Some years ago, the Chamber of Birmingham fought to get a branch office of University of Alabama here in Birmingham, today, UAB. And some time ago, they fought to get a medical school here. That has been a part of our salvation. Uh, so we began working closely with research and health care, with uh, Southern Research. We had, we worked, we had nine, of, Birmingham got to be a regional bank center for Alabama. Of the 10 major banks in Alabama, nine of them had their headquarters here in Birmingham. We worked hard on that. Uh, we had sub offices, of 10, of the 500 uh, companies, 10 of them had sub offices here. We got that done. We initiated incubators. The first incubator to develop business on UAB campus that we financed. They cooperated with us and we created an uh, incubator. Created a seven, several now even innovation depot is a fruit of what we did. That's when our incubators that we started. Today still producing new businesses. Let me try to move through. One of the issues was an airport authority. Don't like to talk about the airport. Atlanta took our airport because we weren't smart enough when they wanted to build the airport in Birmingham in 47. We wouldn't move the airport. So they left us and went to Atlanta. Atlanta built it. But one of the things we did, the chambers asked me if I would give up my authority as a, as a head of the airport authority, because the airport authority, our airport was a department of the city. And no mayor wants to give up his authority. But anyway, I did that, and that has 
worked wonders for us with the airport and what the airport has been able to do with flight and things of, uh, of that sort. We got the insurance companies here, we are trucking and a rail company. And we got something called Leadership Birmingham. Let's look at the next, uh, next slide, please. If I see if I have another one. One of the reasons we survived in Birmingham is because we carried out an ambitious annexation program. During my time as mayor, we annexed 60 square miles to the city of Birmingham. When I became mayor, Birmingham was a city of 60 square miles. When I left, Birmingham was a city of 120 square miles. Uh, as a square, as a, we had a tough time in our annexations. It's gone, thank you. It's a tough time with uh, annexations. The mayor association fought us on everything, just the kind of mayor's association. Though we were a member, they fought Birmingham on it. Uh, Hoover fought us through court, all the way through the Alabama Supreme Court, trying to overturn our annexations. Anyway, we ended up annexing all of those square miles. So today, if you go down 280, you're in Birmingham for quite a distance. There are thousands of jobs created in the area that we are next. It is very important to us for our tax base today. That is how we strengthen the city's tax base. I'll just mention two other things and then I'm going to really stop. What do I have another slide? Let's say, what is that? I've talked a little bit about reforming the Birmingham Police Department. I told you what the situation was like. When I got on the council, there was a report from the Police Foundation of New York about the use of deadly force against citizens. They pointed out three cities, they studied 20 cities, and they pulled three of them out as being the cities with the worst police departments in terms of deadly force killing people. It was Baltimore, Detroit, and Birmingham. Those were the three. That study is still available today. They, those three cities had a terrible record of killing people. We set out to reform the police department. Shortly after I became mayor, our police chief resigned, so I had the chance to pick the first police chief. That was a big fight. I did not want to pick any police chief that the personnel board gave me, and uh, they took me to court. And so for nearly two years, we were in court fighting over who was going to be the police chief. I was insisting that I was not going to appoint anybody from that list of 10 that they gave me. Uh, there was one person only I wanted, but he was number 10 on the list. And they said you had to choose from the top three. Birmingham, uh, Jefferson County, all the cities here used to have what's called uh, three people to pick from when you uh, fill a job. They give you, the person there will give you three names and you choose somebody from that. So when I refused to do it, they finally, after a year or so fighting court, the jury finally called me in and said to me, you know, you either pick a chief or you go to jail. And of course, I didn't want to go to jail. <laughs> so I went on the list and I picked the chief from outside of Birmingham Police Department from New York. And that's already Dodge. And, uh, I won't talk anymore about Artie Deutsch, <laughs> but he was our police chief. I had also gotten rid of in Birmingham the fleeing felon law. There used to be in Birmingham, when the police officer arrived at a site where there had been a crime, if they saw somebody that they thought committed a crime and the person was running away, we had a law called the fleeing felon law. Many people, mostly black folk, were shot as fleeing felons. I insisted, I changed the policy, I insisted that as mayor I was also in charge of the police department and I changed the policy. 
I was very unpopular, and the white community was very upset with me. I said to the officer, our policy has changed. You, you cannot shoot a fleeing felon. Uh, that saved a lot of lives. But more important than that, in a, a year or two, the United States Supreme Court threw out fleeing felons. So we got rid of the fleeing felon law. We succeeded in getting the police department accredited. It was the second, second accredited police department in the United States. And so that's the story of the police department. Look at minority participation, and I'll sit down. When you get black mayors, you're going to have to talk about minority participation. I call the era of the 1970s the era of black mayors. 1967, Cleveland elected a black man. Then Gary got one the next, that same year. And then Detroit got one. And then Los Angeles got Tom Bradley, only black man he ever had. And then Atlanta got Mena Jackson. And then New Orleans got Dutch Mariel. And in 1979, Birmingham got Richard Harrington. I call that the era of black men. Immediately attention in those cities turned to what kind of business are the minority contractors getting from the city in the era of black men. Here's what we did. You get some idea of what minority participation was like. Uh, the construction contracts they got, so forth and so on. Let's just give you an idea of what we were able to do with minorities in that's a five year period. And over here, and, and I'm going to just finish that, but over here are names of the minority firms that got the contracts. One thing I learned as mayor is that when I was running, I couldn't just say to folk, we did X number of contracts with minority. They would say, no, they didn't see. So we started publishing every name of every minority firm we had. And so we've had good minority participation. I'll tell you about the Kirkland. Uh, we, we redid the 4th Avenue business district. I was surprised to learn that on 4th Avenue, most of the small businesses there, aside from the businesses owned by Dr. Gaston, Mr. Willie, who worked with Dr. Gaston, uh, blacks didn't own them. They were renting. They were renting. I was surprised that some black businesses had been there and they didn't own it. So we put in place a program to help them, under the Block Grant program, get money, buy the property, so that in the Fourth Avenue business district, much of the property of that small businesses now owned by the people who were there. I'm very proud of what we did with the Fourth Avenue business district and what we call the Urban Impact Program. I'm going to tell you about the clinic. I'm going to tell you about the Kirkland Clinic model. When we were, when the health authority of UAB was getting ready to build the Kirkland Clinic, some of you know what the Kirkland Clinic is? Yes. We ought to be very proud of it. The Kirkland Clinic, we were arguing about minority participation in that project. So the company that got the contract said, you don't have enough minority firms here who can do the work. And so that was a big fight going. Kirkland Clinic is named after Dr. Kirkland. Do you remember his first name? Yeah, Dr. John. Dr. John Kirkland, who was an international heart surgeon, known all over the world. That's why they named the clinic for him. He was at UAB, Dr. Kirkland. I had not met Dr. Kirkland. I certainly knew who he was. He called me one day in my office and said, Mayor, can you come over to my office and have lunch with me? And I did. And he said to me at the lunch, my contractor tells me that there's just not enough minority participation here. He said he can't get more than 1%. And, and, and I, so I wanted to ask you, what do you think we can do? He says, now, nah, I'm not a specialist on a lot of the race issues. I'm from Minnesota, he said. And we don't deal a lot with race problems in Minnesota, he told me. But I would like to know what you think we can do. I said, well, doctor, I know we can get 10, maybe 15%. 
And he said, well, all right, here's what we will do. I am going to require them to have at least 15% minority participation. I want you to make sure they get three minority firms in there. And I want you to hire somebody to monitor the whole project uh, to see if it works, because it can be a model for you to solve the minority participation program. That was very helpful with Dr. Kirkland. The clinic is something we ought to be proud of. It was designed by I.M. Pay. Y'all know I.M. Pay? Oh, yeah. He just died last year. Internationally known architect. He designed it. We worked closely with Kirkland Clinic. We helped them acquire the land that they would need to do it. All the way up to what used to be Central Bank, the city did all of that with them. We have never completed the project, maybe we never will. Because as it was drawn, as you see the Kirkland Clinic today, the plan is that there would be a mirror image clinic right in front of it, on the other side of the street, and we acquired all the property for it. But that's uh, just some examples. So now I close. Let's see the last slide. Uh, I forgot another. I, I don't think I need to talk about Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. It stays in the news all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Idea of Civil Rights Institute came from David Van, a uh, person who I handpicked and never paid her, just worked her hardest here to lead it and make it a reality as old dresser Wolf Hall, who said, sit here. <laughs> business community did not want us to have the institute. They sent a committee to me in my office and said, Mayor, we don't need another civil rights institute. They brought with them a newspaper from the commercial appeal, I think, commercial appeal, something like that, in Memphis. They met the commercial appeal. So see here, they opened up a civil rights institute there at the hotel where Dr. King had been killed. And we just don't need to know. Gonna, all you're going to do, Mayor, is you're going to open up old wounds with that institute. And they wanted me to forget about it. I talked with Evidence and her committee, and they said, no, we go ahead, we can do it. And it wasn't easy to do. It was not easy to do. I had a bond, uh, had them to vote on bonds to build it. We needed $12 million to build it and to vote on bonds to build it. I had already been depending on the black community to deliver the votes when we had a bond issue. We voted on it, and it failed. The black community didn't give us enough support. Odessa's group said, don't, don't give up. Go at it again. I was down at City Hall crying and going on Jimmy. And some of the neighborhood officers say, let's go down and see about the mayor. He down and said, all crying. <laughs> and they say, okay, mayor, tell you what, get the council to call the bond election again, and we will get the vote out for you. And so I did. And so they did not get the vote out. We lost. And so then we had to find a way to build it and, and to pay for it. So I'm going to close with it. it tr it's there because we tried to tell the story of what Birmingham is about. Birmingham is a site of the, that gave birth to the Civil Rights Institute, of, I mean the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. It comes right out of Birmingham. It is the most far-reaching Civil Rights Act uh, in, in our government. It is a story about a city moving from being a Johannesburg of the South to being a civil rights city. We try to tell it, we put it in a historic place because of 16 Baptist Street Baptist Church is there. It was designed by Rayfield of somebody, a black architect. We had very few black architects in our life. Here, 16 Street Baptist Church is a historic church designed by one of the few black architects I got out of Tuskegee. It's historic for that reason. When I got ready to build the institute, I had black and white coming. I had Atlanta, Herman Russell, and I had, what about Jim? Harvard, 
to draw a picture on it, but I had to hire some architects to design it. I uh, got in bad trouble with local black architects who wanted to do it. I wanted some architects who had a reputation. And so I went searching for some architects. I ended up hiring the architects, Bond, Ryder, and James. Uh, John, uh, uh, Bond was uncle. Bond, Ryder, they were professors at Columbia University. They had a reputation. They had helped with the Guggenheim Museum. They had done architecture, things all over Africa. And so we hired them. If you look at that institute, it probably looks different from any other civil rights institute. And there are a lot of them. They are nicely built, but they don't tell any story. I always try to tell a story. The cupola, the shape of it, is based on what the church shape. We try to tie it all in together. And right around the corner, the mayor is now renovating the A.G. Gaston Motel. Most of you don't know, that used to be the only motel black folk in Birmingham could attend, was the A.G. Gaston Motel. That's a part of our history. And that's what we try to tell. And I thank you, you've been good. Thank you, everyone. We have a few moments for questions. If anyone has a burning desire, raise your hand, and Uche here will bring you a microphone to ask any questions you might have. Uh, what was the greatest challenge that you had uh, in your last four years in terms of some of the things that you were trying to accomplish. I remember the MAPS program, but you're all very involved in it. Well, we didn't have time to talk about all of the good things that people did when I was mayor. We formed the strongest black political organization that the South had ever seen, called the Citizens uh, Coalition. And the problem that we had was, of course, that to, to, to keep it uh, together. Uh, we once had a, a political organization, and uh, we turned out the black vote. I could tell you, I could tell you what the black vote was going to be in every box. What the turnout was going to be. We were not having to pay for it; they were volunteering to do it, and they were competing with one another. If I wanted to talk about North Birmingham, I called Bob Washington and George McCoy, and I said, hey, "This is how many votes we need. You, the captains over there." When they'd come to the meeting, they would compete with other folks, say, this is how many we turned down. So that was, uh, that helped cha to, to, to uh, change, uh, change the set. I can say a lot about it, but. May I have a question? Helpful. Yeah. I'm just curious how your feelings about David Band changed over the years, because his reaction to the Benita Carter essentially lost you as mayor, but then you ended up bringing him back for a lot of the annexation work and... Yes, you're absolutely right. David Van, Andrew Proctor, who was Miss Alabama, and I were elected to the city council at the same time. The Birmingham News and Post Hero, the next morning had a big sign up. Van Proctor Arrington, elected. They were calling that a movement away from the conservative council to the liberals on the council. As I said, I got to know David. We really got to be friends. I learned that he was very smart and knew how government worked. We spent much time together, a lot of time in my office, sometimes in my own home, eating collard greens, and on David Lear and eating, we talk about how to do, do uh, problems. Uh, when David was elected mayor, he was elected mayor because the black community made him mayor. George Siebels had been the mayor for two times and running the third time uh, and had been getting the black vote. And Tony Harrison and I worked to take, to get the black vote to go away from George Siebels and go to Van. That is how Van uh, was elected. When Van didn't 
fired a police officer and the people that drafted me to run for mayor, we, we, we still, you know, we remain friends. We defeated him, he lost the first round. And, uh, David did. The night that I was elected, David was there with me as a part of my family. When Carter called, he was sitting right there uh, with me. Uh, when I was sworn in, uh, I turned to David, because I had been working with him on some of the next session projects while he was a man. And I offered him the job of being a, a member of the law department of the city of Birmingham to help me with the next session. And he did that. Most of the next sessions carried out was carried, were carried out by me and David Van. Uh, David loved the city. David had come back to Birmingham. He used to be a clerk for the U.S. Supreme Court. He had come back to Birmingham. And people had said, David, white folks said, David can never be an elected dog catcher in Birmingham. He's too liberal. Black folk didn't think he was liberal. He thought he was moderate. But white folk thought he was liberal. And they said he couldn't be elected to anything. And sure enough, most white folk never voted for him. It was the black folk who put David in office. But he was really a godsend. And some folks say to me sometimes, they're talking about, they say, Arrington, you know, they say this, you did this, that, and the other. You did a, I say, but folks say you didn't do it. They say that David did that. And I always say, well, they're right. <laughs> I say, uh, may I help? I didn't know the law. I had, to, I had to hire somebody who knew it. I'm not a lawyer. I said, you know what? I picked up your garbage all the time. I said, but you never seen me out there picking up. I got enough sense to hire somebody who knows how to pick up the garbage. What a mayor does is he has to be an administrator. He has to have people around him who can make things happen. And if I had any success as mayor, it was because I knew how to do that. I surrounded myself with some smart people. A lot of them were very young people. Thank you. But they always had ideas. And they were always telling me, Mayor, we ought to do this and we ought to do that. And that's the secret of whatever success we had. May I just want to thank you for your leadership. And I want to thank you for bringing me along for 43 years as being a neighborhood officer and, and being involved in citizen participation. But you didn't tell the story about Elma Harris when you went to that meeting. You don't have to tell it. <laughs> well, Birmingham has so many stories. Is that the one about the golf situation? Or which one? You you worked for Elma. Yeah, we, uh, we went to the meeting and I think uh, you said, why did you bring me here? You should have told me. Oh, yeah. Well, we had a lot of, you know, it's a big mess about it the golf tournament here and all that, they had time to tell all that stuff. Birmingham has a thousand stories to tell about trying to get rid of racial problems and how we approach them. Anything else? One more. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, we, they have city, we have now have city planning. Most of that occur, started occurring back in the 1970s when we started doing the master plan for the city. I'm sure that the administration now updates the master plan. Uh, there's a lot of uh, power in the neighborhoods. If people will work in their neighborhoods, uh, some of the problems in the neighborhoods we, we know about, but it takes people to participate to help solve. You know more about what goes on in your neighborhood than anybody else. I lived in black neighborhoods just about all my life, in black neighborhood. I knew where the shot house was. I knew where you could get this, that, and the other. We didn't tell the police. We had problems cropping up. And we used to wonder, how come we had such serious problems? I believe today that there's not a neighborhood, not a black neighborhood, that does not know who's pushing drugs in that neighborhood.
Who's creating problems there? And they sit by and they say nothing until something happens, and then they want to know what's wrong. You know, the mayor can't do more in your neighborhood than you're willing to do yourself. Well, interesting things are happening in this city, and don't miss it. Uh, gentrification is taking place. White folk who left this city are coming back in to the city. Condos and so forth you see sprouting up all over the city because people are coming back into the city. Uh, there is going to be some kind of cooperation uh, in the city, and we can build. But the truth is, nothing happens in the city if people living there don't want to pay for it. We were never able, I didn't get around to talking about the MAPS program. We were never able to do a dome stadium, the big thing, Atlanta did too. We didn't do the Apple, all of that stuff. Because uh, we took, when we put it up for a vote, vote, vote it down. They, the folk opposed to say they got a plan B. Well, it's telling me, and they didn't have a plan B. They just wanted to kill it. Uh, let me get him. White people had doubt. That's what I didn't know. That. Oh, white folk left this town like mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, sir. This gentleman here. So, um, oh, I was waiting for him. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I have one, one question for Charlie. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm um, I just wanted to ask you. Um, over the years, you've seen Birmingham evolve so much. You've seen um, a lot of progress, and then I know you do know that there are uh, economically for black citizens in Birmingham. Uh, a lot of us have not progressed, but over the years, when, you, when we speak of economically for black citizens in Birmingham, over the time, how do you feel about the state of black Birmingham as far as economically? from your tenure as mayor up until now? It's improving. <coughs> it's not as big as it ought to be. People like to look at us and say, you know they're doing this in Atlanta, and they're doing that in Atlanta, and Birmingham ain't doing this. And that's true. But what happened, you have to, we just have to tell it like it is. What happened in Atlanta, number one, and they, they had, had some good elected officials, and I gave them full credit. In 1947, I told you, Southern Airline, which was called that time, today they call it Delta, came to Birmingham and tried to work with the Birmingham business community and the chamber to relocate the airport so they could build there. The city government and the chamber turned them down. They went the next month to Atlanta. Atlanta embraced them, even had a parade for them. They built the airport there. That airport brings in billions of dollars into Atlanta. When we look around to find minority businesses, the best minority business who got bonding capacity and so forth, they look around and see where are the best opportunities. We go to Atlanta, because they, they, and Birmingham has some projects, but we don't have anything that matches the airport in Atlanta. Other words, let me say it this way. I always, when we talk about minority participation, what percentage they're going to get, I always say, let's look at the size of the pie. The bigger the pie, the more major projects you have in Birmingham, the more business there is for minority firms. But we have to pay for that. And we've been slow doing it. But yet, I will put up our numbers today of minority participation, and it would look favorable 
with the minority participation everywhere. Though we were being out and by Atlanta and Houston while I was mayor. Uh, but we, we, we're making progress. We got some good numbers. But I always think we should have done five or ten times more. Yes. Corporations are very important to every community. And they, first of all, they're going to provide the jobs for the community. Secondly, they have influence because they provide the jobs and they have so much of money. They have a lot of influence. They can get out front and make things happen. One of the stories that Harvard Business College tells all the time, and you can read the report, is how U.S. Steel failed Birmingham when we were in the midst of a fight over race. The U.S. Steel office took hands off. Uh, they were building Pittsburgh, they were getting business and having business in Birmingham, but they failed us completely. That, that is beginning to change. We were only able to vote on the MAPS program, which would have changed this whole city, would have given us a million dollars worth of projects. The project failed, let me just tell you, the MAPS project failed uh, because it became a race project. We were doing a multi-million dollar project. Dome Stadium, thousands of jobs. But the only way we could vote to pay for it was a one cent tax. <coughs> the only way we could do it was by a county-wide vote. And the only way we could have that vote is that the legislature would have to, of Alabama would have to approve it. And they would, it would take any one vote and the legislature would kill it. And I have never seen anything go through the Alabama legislature that somebody didn't oppose it, at least some. But here is the power of the corporate community. Much to my surprise and satisfaction, the Birmingham corporate community got the Alabama legislature to pass the MAPS program without a single dissenting vote. I've never seen that before. The Birmingham corporate community put up about $3 million to pay for getting out the vote. And so we could have a vote. We were doing well. All the polls said it was going to pass. We were going to have a dome stadium. Uh, we were going to unite the police departments in the, from the suburbs and the way. And all of that was included in it. We had it all written in. We were feeling good. And then it started falling apart. Why did maps fail? First of all, it started failing from inside. Three members of the council decided they couldn't support it. Jimmy Blake, Dick Hay, and Johnson went out and argued against it, went to the other citizens and said, why are you supporting Birmingham? That helped kill it. Secondly, Mary Buckaloo, the program started out, it was supposed to be a program headed by the mayor of Birmingham and the president of the county commission. Mary Buckaloo was the president of the county commission. For some reason, Mayor Buckaloo bailed out, said she'd have nothing else to do with it. Didn't tell us. Called the news conference. Bailed out. We don't have a, a co-chair. We don't have a white co-chair. Well, all we got left is Richard Aaron. And most white folks don't like him. He's the chairman. The Jewish community bails us out. They get a businessman, he comes in. Then they say, well, the polls are now showing that we might lose this. Why? Because we are polling in the white community, they don't like Arrington. So we need to find somebody else. And really, we had meetings, and we said, well, okay, what's black elected official? You know, might, might be able to help. And they came up with two names, Chris McNatt and Larry Lane. And so we went to Larry. And we got Larry to come and cut spots for us, had him on TV with a white child in his own, 
<laughs> talking about, you know, why we need to pass that one syntax. But it got to be such a race issue that the record turnout of white voters in Jefferson County occurred on that. It passed in Birmingham, although about a third of Birmingham voters didn't bother to vote. Mm -hmm. It passed in Birmingham. It failed overwhelmingly in the county. Mountain Brook, Homewood, Vestavia, all name it, it failed. That all has to do with corporations and who leads and what they're willing to do and things of that sort. Thank you. We got one last question. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. Say that again. Oh, God, I have met so many famous people. I told you, I told you the night I was elected, the president called me. He invited me to the White House. The next week, I was dining with the president, three times with President Carter, I was at the White House. I have sat at the table, at the small kitchen table, with President Carter, his daughter-in-law, and his son. And with, I'm trying to think of one employee, uh, one politician from here. But I have met him. I, I, when I was elected mayor, I told you, it was a big situation. Everybody wanted me to come. I, I didn't have time to do it. The anti runs, everybody wanted me to come. I spoke all over the country. I went to Detroit. They had Joe Lewis Arena. It was packed when I got there. Just the fact that a black man, they wanted to see, is that for real? Black folk were all over the place. Jesse Jackson invited me to come to his church in Chicago. They picked me up at the airport in a limo, driving down the streets in, in south side of Chicago. Black folk lined up on both sides, honking and waving at me. <laughs> they couldn't believe it. In Birmingham, Alabama. And if you read my book, it's called There's Hope for the World. I'm in Copenhagen, Denmark. In Denmark. And the newspaper in Copenhagen carries a small article saying the mayor of Birmingham, Alabama, an African American, is here in Denmark. The next day, the mayor from a little city right across the bay of Copenhagen sends somebody over and invites me to have lunch. They want to have a lunch in my honor. <coughs> I took the, the boat across the bay, my wife and I, got off the boat, and we had to walk about a block to get to the city hall. All along the walk were people lined up, looking. <laughs> Finally, two white women stepped out, the sweetest women stepped out, this was the sweetest time, stepped out and said, sir, are you the mayor of Birmingham, Alabama? And I said, yes, I am. And she said, well, we just had to come to see it for our sins. <laughs> if, Bur if Birmingham, Alabama can have a black for mayor, there is hope. Father world. That's what I would